Well, hello, everybody, and uh, uh, greetings from Southern California. Uh, I wish I could be in uh, uh, Norway with you right now, but uh, it is my pleasure and my, my honor to get to speak to you at Konzo this year. Uh, my name is Stuart Sumita. I am a professor of biology, actually. I'm a professor of biology in the California State University System. And the California State University System is one of the, is the largest public university system in the world in fact. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, in our state university system, we do have some animation and gaming uh, studies programs. Uh, ironically, we don't have one at my campus. There are 23 campuses in the system, uh, and I am apparently the only person who actually works directly with studios. My, my day job is as a professor of biology, and if you look at my background, you can see some of my favorite animals. And you'll notice actually uh, in those, in the background, if I move out of the way a little bit, some of my favorite animals from some of the projects in which I've worked in the past. Uh, because as a biologist, I teach anatomy. And when you teach anatomy, of course, that means you have to understand how organisms work and how they move. Uh, and so one of my favorite uh, organisms that I help figure out how they work and move is this little fellow here. This is uh, the horse from Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, which was a film that DreamWorks did in 1999. Uh, and as an example, uh, when we worked on that film, I spent six months teaching anatomy, both horses, live, with skeletons, behavior, riding, taking artists to equestrian centers and working with them, all so we could make an animated film. Uh, now, of course, the, the uh, science and art of animation is uh, much broader than it used to be, uh, and especially now with uh, the kind of work that we do with uh, not just film, but also with visual effects, gaming, uh, commercials, even things that you build for your cell phones. So it's my hope that today I can uh, convince you that uh, it's interesting and worthwhile to spend some time with a scientist who's interested in art. Now, in uh, the English-speaking world, one of the uh, acronyms we use is STEM, uh, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, and uh, it's important. Uh, the technology that brings me to you today is part of STEM, but I prefer to think in terms of STEAM by adding the art into STEM. So I'm going to share my screen with you now and give you a little bit of an example as to why a biologist has so much fun talking with artists. So let me do that for you. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about some of the uh, anatomical and biological concepts that I use when I'm speaking to people who work in the animation, visual effects, and gaming industries. There are many, many ideas, concepts, or rules, if you will, uh, that come from science uh, that are useful. Uh, and I don't have time to go through all of them today, but I'm going to talk to you about the ones that seem to be the most common uh, themes and threads that I've, I've used uh, over the years uh, with studios. I'm just going to give you a, a taste of each one, uh, and then hopefully at some point in the future we'll have uh, the opportunity to spend more time together and flesh some of them out. So, but before I do, let me tell you a bit about the kind of biology that I do. Uh, I'm a paleontologist, and I know that most of you think paleontologists study dinosaurs. <laughs> well, in fact, uh, I don't study dinosaurs, and I'm very sorry, um, and all the children expect me to tell you about dinosaurs. Uh, this animal here, by the way, I must tell you, is not a dinosaur. Uh, it comes in all the little plastic dinosaur toy kits, but it is not a dinosaur. It lived about 60 million years before the earliest dinosaur, uh, and before anybody asks, uh, we still don't know what that big sale was for. Uh, everybody says it's for warming up and cooling off, and we've done all the studies, and no, it doesn't work that way. It's probably just to show off to get dates. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, I study animals much older than dinosaurs, and uh, but but don't worry, I'll, I'll I'll mention dinosaurs in a bit. Now I will tell you this much: paleontologists don't do what you see on television. Uh, with all that silly cleaning of things with brushes. Oh my goodness, could you imagine how long it would take to get a dinosaur out of the ground by cleaning it with a brush? It would take you centuries. Uh, mostly, we spend most of our time walking and looking. 
And then when we, after we find something, we take it out with, with hammers and, and things like that. Now, that being said, uh, we get to work in some very exciting and beautiful places. Uh, this is me with uh, my field crew in, in uh, southeast, southeastern Utah in the United States. Uh, our accommodations are excellent. Uh, and I will go past that slide quickly, not to because I'm embarrassed, uh, but rather because if otherwise you would find out how much weight I've gained over the years. Uh, this is one of my favorite spots in southeastern Utah. And I love to show this to artists because this is a rock formation where we look for fossils. But if you look at this rock formation, you see some things and I see other things perhaps. But here's what I see. Uh, we named this rock formation because we found some fossils near it. Uh, and the students with me named this rock formation Grandma Watches TV Rock. Now, that I've said that, there's Grandma sitting on her settee. Grandma has a bun on her head, probably. Grandma has an old-fashioned box tellers, and Grandma does not have a flat-screen TV. However, uh, I think Grandma has her hands clasped over her lap. And my addition to their interpretation was that I think there's a, a, a kitty cat sleeping on top of the warm television set. Now, these are all images and shapes. And now that I say Grandma watches television, it's hard not to see it. But what you also see here geologically is shape, lighting, color, texture. These are all things that we both talk about. So interestingly enough, a paleontologist has some things in common with artists. Now, I will tell you that, it's, as I said, it's not like television. <laughs> okay. um, mostly, mostly it's a filthy, dirty, nasty work. It's not as... Um, uh, uh, as uh, romantic as you might think. Uh, this is us doing uh, field work in central Germany a number of years ago when the summer temperatures never went above eight degrees. So, um, so, so yeah, not like television, but there you are. Now, now remember that first image I showed you, uh, the animal with all the spines on its back, not a dinosaur. Uh, here are some of the pieces. And if you look at them, they're all tortured and twisted and bendy. And Many people would tell you, well, that's because they've been fossils in the ground for, for, for you know, millions and millions of years. And, but we've cut them up and looked at them under microscopes, and you know what? That's what they were shaped like. And I can tell you all sorts of stories about why we know that, but the best thing for me to do is to use some art, right? Because the picture tells a thousand words, or maybe more. And so what we have here is an illustration by one of my favorite artists, a fellow named Michael Skrepnik, that shows you that that animal is probably a little bit more organic looking than before. But the key is this, that when the science comes together with the art, it makes a much greater impact. Now, of course, as a paleontologist, people expect me to know about dinosaurs. And yes, we do talk about dinosaurs. This is the skull of probably the most famous dinosaur ever, a Tyrannosaurus rex. And interestingly enough, Dinosaurs have had a massive influence on the history of media. The first animated character ever was a dinosaur, Gertie the Dinosaur, over a century ago. Barely a quarter of a century after that, we had already come to the, the level of technology that brought us Fantasia. And, and barely 50 years after that, you had the first Jurassic film. Now, it's interesting, the amount of time between Gertie and Fantasia is about the amount of time we've had between the first Jurassic film and the most recent one. So the speed at which the technology is increasing uh, in our industry is remarkable. It is absolutely remarkable. So there's Gertie, right? But Gertie is a cartoon dinosaur. I am a biologist and as a paleontologist, I'm interested in bones. So there are a set of bones, but let's take a look at what these bones can show us. Oh no, isn't that interesting? This is one of the most fortuitous sets of illustrations I've ever seen. Now skeletons are critical, not only to me as a scientist, but to you as artists. Why is that? Here's a great classic example. This is a skeleton of a deer. 
Many of you probably recognize this skeleton of this deer. This is Bambi slipping on the ice in the film Bambi from many, many years ago. Okay. That film was blocked out entirely in skeletal form before they ever went to animation. And we've been doing this in my field and in yours for decades. Okay. Here's an example of some beautiful illustrations by uh, one of my favorite uh, scientific artists, a gentleman named Mauricio Antonio, he's uh, based in Spain. Uh, and you know what, in parallel with that, Jin Kim at the Disney Studios is doing the exact same thing to create compelling characters on screen. So I have the great uh, privilege of doing biology with people who are interested in these kinds of things. And here are some of the things that I get to talk about when I go to film, gaming, and other kinds of studios. Okay? These are the ones that I talk about the most. Now, to be fair, visual effects and uh, animation studios tend to like certain uh, things more often, and gaming studios tend to uh, like other things a little bit more often. But these are the big five. When you study animals, your diet is key. Size is important because big and small do different things. Age matters depending on whether you're an adult or a child. In humans, whether you're male or female is key. And of course, when we create mythical beasts, actually, they're not that mythical. We're mostly building them out of pieces we already know, which means you need to know the first four things. So. Real quickly, a few examples. You are what you eat. This is the first project I ever worked on, and it probably looks a bit recognizable to you. Okay, That horse there looks a whole lot like Philippe the horse from Beauty and the Beast, and that wolf, of course, looks like the wolves that chase them through the forest. And when I first worked on this project, the answer to me was not to teach the artists how to draw. It was to explain to them how characters move, and the answer is what you eat. Plant eaters and meat eaters have different kinds of diets. Therefore, they have different body shapes. And I could go on and on and on about that, but I won't bore you with your high school biology. But I will tell you this, that because plant material is more difficult to digest than meat, plant eaters are big. They're barrel shaped. They're less flexible. And when you're less flexible, that impacts your movement and your movement impacts your animation. The pattern in which your feet touch the ground is even different. The order and sequence in which you locomote and move is different. So here we have some beautiful animation that was done by James Baxter, formerly of Disney and DreamWorks, now with Netflix, showing the, the, the two different types of motion that we see in a horse, say, which is an herbivore, versus a dog, which is a carnivore. Even the placement of your eyeballs is determined by what you eat. Because any animal that has to catch its prey, meat, has its eyes facing forward so that it has depth perception so it can catch its food. But animals with, uh, with plants as their diet have their eyes on the side of their head because plants don't run away. So they don't need depth perception. And where your eyeballs sit impact fundamentally how you act. And when I say act, I don't mean behavior, I mean acting on screen. Okay. Now, of course we cheat. Of course, we cheat, especially when we work by hand. Okay? We can put eyeballs anywhere we want. And, and oh, by the way, everything seems to have eyebrows, don't they? <laughs> but those are some of the uh, artistic licenses that we, we get to have. So, so here we have um, uh, the, the big barrel-shaped plant-eating uh, horse and the slim, bendy, uh, flexible carnivores. Uh, in the film Beauty and the Beast. Now, we have used this rule over and over again for decades. Um, the most recent uh, project we worked with on this was for Life of Pi, which was a photorealistic visual effects film, not a hand-drawn film. Okay? And we've done it with all sorts of things in between. This is a caricature of my son, the year he was born, uh, which was 2001, uh, with a big wide-bodied herbivore. Now, many big wide-bodied herbivores are so big that they have constraints on how they move. And as we like to say, size matters. Big animals move differently from small ones, and we've used that as projects, uh, uh, 
project focuses in, in a variety of situations. So for me, some of the most uh, uh, compelling ones were how we had to understand how a small animal like a rodent moves uh, versus how a big animal like uh, an elephant moves because that's our model for dinosaurs. Okay? And those wound up being projects that uh, we used at Pixar for Ratatouille for our small animals and for Good Dinosaur for our big ones. Now we could go on and on about that, but let's go to the next rule, which is that age matters. Small babies are cute. Adults are not as cute, but there are reasons. There are mostly proportional reasons in terms of the size of our heads, the size of our bodies, the proportions of our hands, and those kinds of things. Babies have big heads, small faces. Their eyes look big because their faces are so small. The position of their eyes in their heads are different because uh, their faces are not large yet. And of course, their hands and bodies look big and chunky compared to an adult. Now, these are what we like to refer to in, 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 in art as the cutification factors. And sometimes we go a little bit too far with them, but uh, they are very, very powerful uh, things that really grab onto our brains when we, we, we look at children. Uh, this illustration, by the way, is by one of my favorite artists, a lady named Denise Shimabukuro, who was the person who also did that illustration that you saw at the front end of this uh, presentation with Philippe and the wolves. And so here's one of my favorite examples. Take a look at the proportions of an adult versus a baby. Oh my goodness. If you saw a two meter tall thing like that walking down the street, it would be terrifying. But when they fit in your arms, they're terribly, terribly cute. This is what I refer to as the Hello Kitty effect. Okay. Uh, why are characters cute? Because of their proportions. And here's some more of Denise's drawings to help make the point. Okay. Um, now, this next drawing was not done by Denise. It was done by a gentleman named Mike Swafford, who did a caricature of me uh, being dissected by a cat uh, during one of my artist development lectures at the Disney Studios. And he helped me uh, to, to communicate to them that when you are talking about people, especially adults, then it's whether or not you're male or female, because male and female proportions are different. And it's critical to get them right for the locomotion and movement, whether you're talking about simple walking or whether you're talking about action. Okay, And that's really critical, especially when we have uh, games where we can see our characters doing things either from a first person or third person perspective. Okay? So what are some of those examples? Females' heads are different. Males' heads are thicker and more robust <laughs> because females hit puberty earlier. Okay. And because of that, they don't lay down as much bone and they have a different construction to the skull. The overall cranial capacity is the same, but men have thicker, lumpier, bumpier heads. Sorry, guys. That's just the case. Okay. Women have wider hips because they have babies. Okay. Uh, men can't have a baby. Men are lucky. They can't have children. Therefore, their hips are narrow, which means they're going to walk in a way that's somewhat different. Women also have relatively longer legs and shorter torsos, which will change their biomechanics. These two people are exactly the same height. Okay? They're wearing the same shoes, but look at the proportional differences in terms of the torsos and the limb length. Okay? Uh, these are, are some colleagues of mine from the University of Sheffield in England, and here we have the exact same uh, consideration on film. Now, if you look at these characters, uh, Zoe Saldana, who plays Gamora, is shorter than Chris Pratt, but her legs are actually longer, and her torso is well shorter. Okay. Now, this is not weird. This is normal. Okay. This particular situation is normal, and so here's where I get to give you a bit of a warning and a bit of a, uh, a lesson uh, from gaming. Here's an example. One of the games that I got to work on, which was super, super fun, was Horizon Zero Dawn. Okay. And when I first arrived uh, in Amsterdam uh, to work with the folks who did Horizon, uh, I, I was there as a paleontologist to work on the creatures. Many of the creatures in that game are, are inspired by dinosaurs and other big animals. Okay. But when I first went there, they showed me the characters, uh, the human characters. And there was some concern because they didn't feel quite right.
right. And I looked at the characters and I said, I know exactly which models you used to build this character. You used these, didn't you? And like, how did you know? I said, because I'm sorry to say, whereas the male's good, the female's not. With all due respect, look at those proportions. That's a man and next to him is a female supposedly, but it's really just a man with breasts because the proportions aren't correct. Okay? This is a much younger, slimmer me. Look at the difference in proportions here. Females have short torsos. This female's torso is way, way, way too long. And when her torso is long and her hips are narrow, she will move like a man. And if it's a female character, we want her to move like a female. When it's a male, we want them to move like a male. Otherwise, everything looks the same and it starts to get boring. Okay. So here's the repurposed alloy, and she has genuinely female proportions. And I have to say, I think she's one of the best female characters we've seen in games in a very long time. And uh, she moves well, she's athletic, but she's athletic in a very distinctive way that's different from all the males in that, in that game, which is great. Uh, she even does gymnastics and tumbling more like a female than like a male. And I think it was an incredibly successful um, uh, endeavor uh, for that particular game. Now, we use this rule on proportion all the time. Most of our characters, even the extreme ones, even the extremely cartoony ones, are using that proportional rule. But then what happens in a character like Judy Hopps from Zootopia? Her legs look sort of like maybe they're too short to be female. Well, she's the cartoon, right? Well, not exactly, because there's her buddy, Nick, okay? Nick is her, her, uh, her, her, uh, her uh, buddy in the buddy film here. But if you look at their body proportions, oh, actually, even though she doesn't look female on her own, compared to Nick, she is definitely of female proportion in terms of the differences of their torso length. Right? So you are what you eat, size matters, age matters, but with human or humanoid characters, whether you're male or female is critical. Now, creatures. Most creatures are built out of things we already know. Dragons are built out of dinosaurs and alligators and pterodactyls and so on, okay? Uh, there are some examples from the uh, uh, the How to Train Your Dragon series, which was a super fun series to work on because we not only had to get the character designs right, but they had to fly. And I got to tell you, I didn't talk about flight, but making things that fly is one of the toughest things to do. It is really hard to do it right. Uh, and I give the folks at DreamWorks who worked on this film a ton of credit. But I got to tell you, the same idea of building things out of stuff we already know works in games as well. So most of the creatures, for example, in Horizon Zero Dawn uh, are built out of things we already know. And I gotta tell you personally, by the way, this shot from Horizon is one of my favorites because not only am I a paleontologist, I work in this part of the world. I've camped there. There are no cactuses like that, but I've camped there. So this is really <laughs> exciting for me, okay? Uh, now, uh, we use inspiration from, from life all the time. So you don't have to redesign everything. There are things out there that will help you and make your life easier. Now, in terms of what I've done over the years, I can tell you, the, the most commonly animated things that I run to are people, cats and dogs and rodents, and there's always a horse. There's always a horse for someone to ride in animated films. In visual effects projects, it's all over the map. But in video games, it's mostly people and people and people and creatures. But the key with those creatures is to build them out of the parts that we learn from the first four rules. So whether or not we're doing traditional hand-drawn animation, digital animation, visual effects, or gaming, there's overlap between all of them. And what's great for me as a scientist is that that overlap okay, is one that lets me interact with the, the artistic community 
which is a powerful, powerful community. And so I'm going to leave you with this thought, is that I wish we could all be together, but this uh, presentation is my opportunity to remind you who are watching today that you work in an industry that is incredibly powerful. Okay? Its history is a powerful one. And this is a, this is a caricature of my son, the year of his birth. Here are my kids now. Okay? And, what, and both of my sons are inveterate gamers. These guys will spend their day on the computer gaming if I let them, okay? I'm a biologist, I'm a scientist, I teach human anatomy to nurses and doctors, which you would think is important, and perhaps it is. But you all who are watching this today are building the world, are building the universe in which my children live. And that's really important because this generation, yours and theirs, is the one that has to fix the world that my generation is broken. Okay? And so you have an opportunity to have a massive, massive effect. And if you can use some of the science I have to offer, that's great. It is my privilege to help you do that because I can't fix it on my own. But with your help, we can make the world a better place. Everybody likes to say that, oh, video and games are, are a distraction, but in fact, they are a tool to move into the future. And without you, our future is not gonna be as good as it could be. So thank you very, very much for your attention today. And I'm very, very grateful to Consul for inviting me to speak to you this year. I hope to see many of you in person in the future, but in the meantime, thank you so very much.